Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Nikki from Illuminated Movement Astrology here to talk today about the upcoming lunar eclipse happening at five degrees Libra on March the 25th, 2024. So this series of eclipses that's been happening since 2023 has been really intense. <laughs> And this one is also going to be intense, keeping in with the theme of 2024 itself, a year of incredible dramatic changes that we will look back on for decades to come. So in this lunar eclipse report, what I want to talk about is the eclipse itself, the energies that are going on with the chart, but I also want to show you how the eclipse can interact with your natal planets, how eclipse energy energizes the planets on your natal chart, and then also take you through some contemplations through the houses. So let's get started. Okay, so just a little reminder for those who are new, because a lot of my subscribers are newer to astrology or learning astrology themselves, the planet is the action. It's the what is happening. And it's actually the most important part of the chart. It's not necessarily the sign, but the planets that dictate what's going on. The sign has more to do with how that action is perceived, the lens through which the action is happening. The houses, those talk about where the action is taking place. What area, what arena of life are we discussing? Is this energy taking place? And then the aspects. The aspects are the conversation between the planets. So for example, the lunar eclipse that's taking place happens because we're having a full moon, which is an opposition of the sun and the moon. And remember, astrology is really, really, really complex. There are so many layers simultaneously occurring and so many different ways in which we could interpret the energy. For example, we could be doing it on a material level. We could look at it on a psychological level, on a global level, all of those kinds of things. And no one astrology report that's any respectable length of time is going to be able to cover all of those topics. So just keep that in mind when you're listening to this or any astrological report. And then finally, astrology describes potential. Okay, it doesn't guarantee an outcome. So even if you hear something here or read it in a book or on another channel, you know, it's not fatalistic. Okay, it doesn't guarantee that something will occur. My astrological perspective. So how I interpret charts for those who are new. I look at charts through the evolutionary and humanistic perspectives. Evolutionary astrology has a focus on the soul's evolution and journey in this lifetime. And humanistic astrology talks about our self-determination in this lifetime. So that's the way in which I look at it. That may or may not resonate for you, but that's my perspective. And the reason I look at it that way is because I feel like it enhances your response ability. In other words, your ability to respond to life. And for me, that's one of the most incredible pieces of astrology and definitely what has changed my life and has really helped the clients from which I work with. So why I like this is because it invites you to participate, right? And to embody the rhythms of your life. Because astrology, amongst other things, is a calendar. It talks about timing, right? It's also a language. It happens to be a cosmic language. And this can help us get more in tune with not just ourselves, but what's going on with the people around us and the world around us. The other reason I love these viewpoints, these astrological perspectives, is because they help you to make connections. They help you to see things from different angles or shine light on things to help you grow. And then lastly, I love this because it reminds you that there are levels of consciousness, right, to how you are working with the energy or not. And the not is often just as important, if not more important than working with the energy that easily flows in your life. And astrology can be a great way to see those kinds of things that may be tripping you up. So when we're talking about eclipses, eclipse seasons, and what the heck are those? Well, eclipses in a general sense are portals of change. They ask us to make adjustments. And they often include evolutionary leaps forward if we can actively participate with the energy. 
in some ways, eclipses almost have a bit of a Uranian feel to them because we don't always know exactly what adjustments they're going to bring, what type of change they're going to bring, or what exactly we will be encountering. And just like the outer planets, sometimes eclipses can feel more like they bring things from the outside in for us to respond to. That's not always the case, but it can be often, especially if we don't understand what the eclipse is actually asking us to participate in. So there's two upcoming eclipses. The first one, as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, is happening on March the 25th, 2024 at five degrees Libra. In Pacific Standard Time, it is happening literally at midnight and a few seconds. So if you happen to live in another time zone, adjust for that. It will most likely be happening for you on March the 24th. So just make that slight adjustment. So this particular eclipse is part of a moon family, meaning a larger grouping of lunations that happen, the new moon, first quarter moon, full moon, and third quarter moon that happen over a period of about two and a quarter years. And they all happen around the same degree in the same sign. So this particular eclipse belongs to a series of lunations that began September the 25th, 2022. That's when we had the new moon in Libra, okay, right around this five degree mark. We had the first quarter moon happening on June the 26th of 2023. And now we're arriving at this full moon point, March the 25th, 2024. This series of lunations, this cycle will conclude on December 22nd of this year, 2024. So when we're looking at this eclipse, we're really seeing energies that we began, a story that we began all the way back in September of 2022. So keep that in mind when you're looking at this particular eclipse. There's a story that's being brought to full illumination where we can really see what it is that we began back at that time, what seeds were planted, what we've been working on, what we've been adjusting. Okay. The final piece of this at December 22nd, that will close out the energy and wrap it up. Now, I'm not going to talk about this eclipse in detail today, but I just want to briefly mention it. Um, because sometimes we get um, a lot of confusion, right, with different reports around going around the internet or social media or whatever um, around the eclipses. And the next total eclipse, this total solar eclipse that happens on April the 8th, you've most likely heard about it. It's um, creating quite the buzz because it's a pretty significant eclipse. That one is happening at 19 degrees Aries. Now that happens to be its own separate moon family. That is the new moon point because when the sun and the moon are together, we have a new moon. This one happens to be next to the nodes, which is what makes it that total eclipse. So in about two weeks from now, we have a whole other two and a quarter year cycle that's going to be beginning. And I'll do a whole separate video on this one because it deserves its own video. But I just wanted you to be aware that these two, even though they're part of the Aries Libra lunar eclipse um, season, they belong to the nodes being in Aries Libra, they're not quite part of the exact same story. They could be, but think of them more maybe in a sense of chapters. Okay, so we're having one chapter that we began in 2022 that's coming to its fullness. That's that lunar eclipse on the 25th. And then the new total solar eclipse on April the 8th has its own storyline that will be going forward for again about two and a quarter years. So just wanted to get that out there for all of you so you understand what you're planting and when and why these cycles are important. So let's talk about the Aries Libra axis. So the eclipses, they were going to be activating both energies here. And I talk about this in, in a lot of my videos, but really astrology is six pairs of signs, not necessarily like 12 individual ones, although the 12 is important as well. But what we're talking about is we're talking about polarities. We're talking about a subject line or a theme and approaching it from two different angles. And Aries Libra is no exception. 
So when we talk about Aries and Libra, if we're talking about the more positive aspects or the more skillful expressions of this Aries Libra energy, we're talking about things like with Aries, we're talking about that I am energy, the place where we can show up and stand up and take up space right? It comes out of Pisces. It comes out of that return to oneness, that kind of primordial disillusion, um, that spiritual sense of awakening that we all have when we come into a physical body and start our lives. That's part of what Aries represents is that initial energy of starting something new and starting a new cycle. Aries, like all the fire signs, is enthusiastic, right? It's courageous. It's instinctive. Aries is a pace setter. It's got a warrior-like quality to it, especially because its ruling planet is Mars. Aries is self-focused. It's straightforward. It's uncomplicated in many ways. You know, when you deal with Aries, you kind of know what you're going to get right? They kind of let you know where you stand, which I really appreciate. <laughs> and then when we're talking about Aries, we're also talking about our will. What's our drive? What's our motivation, right? What's our independence? Where do we meet conflict and competition? Because all of these things are really important. Now, Libra is the other side of this axis. Libra is the seventh sign in the zodiac where we move from the subjective signs, the self-focused signs, which go Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, and Virgo, to the more subjective signs, the ones that deal with partnerships and groups, which starts at Libra. Libra is the place where we meet the other. It's the energy of you are right? In relationship to I am. And so when we look at this, we're talking about the awareness of other people, right? We're talking about negotiation. We're talking about diplomacy. We're talking about compromise in some way. We're talking about charm. Libra is very charming, right? They are very socially oriented. Libra ruled by Venus, loves harmony and beauty and the arts, things that are pleasing. As an error sign, Libra has to do with ideas. It has to do with social, with rationality, with civility, right? And as I mentioned, it's very relational. And it can be a little bit more aloof. Even though Aries is focused on relationships, one-on-one -on -one relationships in particular, it's not necessarily emotionally invested the same way its neighboring sign Scorpio is, right? Libra doesn't really like to get into the dirty, messy parts of relationship, maybe more so in negotiating, but then they like to kind of walk away, right? And move on. So in that sense, Aries and Libra are also in some ways uncomplicated, right? Or at least they can try to be. So when we're looking at this balance between Aries, which is independence and self-focused, and we're looking at Libra, which is, in a sense, codependence and other-focused, when we get the balance of those two things together and we meet in the middle, we're talking about coherence and we're talking about interdependence, which is really, really important, right? We need self and other in balance. When those things get out of balance, well, way out of balance, really, that's when a lot of problems can occur, right? And when we enter into relationships with other people, often we're talking about things that really reflect who we are, whether that's conscious or unconscious, parts of ourselves and ways that we grow, ways that we understand who we are, is truly in relationship to other people, people that are outside of us, reflecting things back to us. So it's a really, really important component about the Aries-Libra axis in our charts. And we'll all have Aries and Libra somewhere, whether or not we have natal planets in those particular signs. So the other side of Aries and Libra, the negative and, you know, not so great, the more unskillful expressions of these signs can really get kind of ugly. Aries can be very immature. It can be dependent. 
It can tend towards self-neglect, can be very afraid, very passive, very timid, um, overly modest and overly agreeable, right? Standing in someone's shadow instead of stepping up to the plates, instead of engaging in that conflict and taking up space. In a sense, the worst of Aries really reflects the worst of Libra. And when we flip it over, when we look at Libra, some of those unskillful qualities of Libra talk about creating conflict, right? Libra can be really belligerent. They can be very contentious when they're not working in their skillful expressions. Aries, or excuse me, Libra can be unjust and insecure and irrational and intolerant, right? Uncivil, if you will. They can be very lazy and very vain. They can be wishy-washy, right? And imbalanced or needy and manipulative. Because Libra is such a skilled negotiator, they know what the other person wants, right? And often they know how to negotiate things around to get what they want. And that can turn pretty nasty, especially if on the other side, if we're dealing with that kind of energy, if we don't have a strong sense of our self, right, that can get really tricky. So when we're looking at, again, that balance between Aries and Libra, if we have done it well, we're talking about coherence and interdependence. And when it goes awry, it goes awry. And so why I'm bringing this up has to do with the nodes. So you've probably heard about the nodes transiting through Aries and Libra. Aries happens to have the north node transiting through it. And Libra happens to have the south node transiting through it. So just briefly, these nodes move through pairs of signs, right, about every year and a half. And where these signs are, excuse me, where these nodes are, that's where we know where the eclipses are going to be. So when we're talking about the transiting north node in Aries, we're talking about energizing Aries themes, writing a new chapter in our Aries house with our Aries planets, right? Or any angles we may have, points we may have in Aries. It's an invitation to embrace Aries qualities that we may be lacking hopefully the positive qualities. And that's what we're going for. And it's also the opportunity to make evolutionary leaps when our nodes transit our particular natal planets, angles, or nodes. So for example, if you have a node, if you have this eclipse happening in conjunction with, let's say, your natal Venus, it's going to energize your natal Venus. It's going to say, whoa, wake up, Venus. Time to make some changes, time to make adjustments, and time to make some big leaps forward. Okay, that's just an example. So when we're talking about that south node, the Libra south node. Again, we're talking about a time period of about a year and a half. But with the south node, it's slightly different than the north node. The south node, we're looking at what we want to let go of, what we want to leave behind. We're talking about energizing Libra themes that have become stale or worn out or no longer serve us in some way. Through this kind of examination, through bringing up kind of in a sense the gunky, the yucky, the unskillful sides of this particular sign, we can make changes to things that are holding us back, right? Or, or potentially issues from our past could, could come up again as well. And again, the idea is to make these adjustments so that we can make evolutionary leaps forward in our life. So when we're talking about this, I know the big question is always with all these videos, right? How will this affect me? Nikki, how is this going to affect me personally? Right? So you're going to be a really great detective and start getting so good at putting these things together so that you have a little bit more agency within your chart. If you don't, if you really need some help with all of these things, you've got the eclipses just lighting up your chart, which is happening for all the cardinal signs right now, cardinal planets right now. Let me know, book an appointment with me. We can go over how these eclipses are lighting up your chart and what the invitations are for you personally 
in a chart reading. So I've got links to book that below in my description. So when we're looking at how this is going to affect you, how this energy is going to show up in your life, keep in mind that there are multiple ways this transit energy could be experienced. And these could be happening on an inner level. These could be happening on an outer level. Okay. They could be happening in ways that are physical or tangible in some way, the things that we can interact with, right? They could be happening on a psychological level. They could be happening in our social structures and our cultural spheres, the world that we interact with, maybe more so in our, in our localized kind of way. Or they could be happening transpersonally, like globally or environmentally or, or things like that, the things that are go very beyond where we are. Or, of course, they could be in any kind of combination of these kinds of things. So keep that in mind, particularly if you don't have planets in your natal chart that are being affected by this particular eclipse. This may be an energy that doesn't necessarily feel very personally relevant to you. It could be something that you see happening more out in the world or with people around you instead. So not every single eclipse um, is really going to feel like it makes a big personal impact to you. It could be something more global, for example. <clears throat> So this particular lunar eclipse in Libra, it's a pretty intense chart. Um, again, one of the things that we really want to look at is what we began September 25th, 2022 in the Libra part of your chart, including any of those Libra planets, right? And then this will be true also for the cardinal signs, which just as a reminder, the cardinal signs are Aries, Cancer, Libra, and Capricorn. So when we look at this, one of the big features here is the planet that's in charge of this entire eclipse chart happens to be Neptune at the final degrees. And Neptune at the final degrees is challenging. It's an outer planet meaning it takes a longer time to move. So when it gets to the final degrees, it's like the intensity dial gets turned up to 11. Neptune is getting very, very loud and will continue to be very, very loud for the next couple of years. And the other thing that's um, relevant about Neptune being the final dispositor of this eclipse chart has to do with clarity. Aries is very clear. It's very direct. It's very straightforward in a lot of ways. But with all the planets on the chart having to answer to Neptune, we are lacking some of that clarity that we might normally associate with particularly the cardinal signs. So Neptune has to do with things that are beyond tangibility, that go way out into spirituality or way down into the depths things that are in a sense unfathomable, right? Neptune is the god of the sea. And if you think about the ocean, what is truly down at the bottom of the ocean, like the bottom of the bottom of the bottom of the trenches? We don't really know, right? For one thing, there's not daylight down there. If we didn't bring artificial light, could we even see? We can't dive down to the depths of the ocean floor without... Um, specialized gear, right? We would be compressed by it. We would be crushed by it. And so there's something here with Neptune on this chart that we can't really see clearly what needs resolution. So I chose the word specifically sensing what needs resolution. Because in, in really in Neptunian terms, Neptune has also to do with things that are in some way kind of foggy. Right. Like if you look out on a foggy day, you can't see with full visibility what's, let's say, 50 miles down the road, but you could on a very clear day. Right. But what happens on a foggy day when you go outside, do you notice that your senses are actually heightened? Because in some way, your vision, your ability to see clearly has been pulled back a little bit. So your sense of smell, your sense of sound, the sense of tactileness gets turned up. 
And that's really true with this eclipse chart is there's something in the senses, there's something maybe in the intuition or in an intangibility that we are going to have to navigate when it comes to this energy. So keep that in mind over the next few months as we are wrapping up this lunar eclipse energy specifically. When we look at this chart, one of the other things that stands out in particular is this yod. So a yod, the finger of God, right? Three planets. So we have at the south node, 15 degrees, making an uncomfortable quincunx to Jupiter at 15 degrees, and another one to Venus at 16 degrees. Those two planets, Venus and Jupiter, are making a sextile. So they're actually harmonious. They're getting along. But the quincunx energy is very uncomfortable. It's like a blind spot. It's like when you're driving in your car before the cars told you where other cars were. So those of you that remember, and you go to change lanes and you swear there wasn't a car there, right? Because you couldn't see them because they were in your blind spot. That's this kind of energy that we're dealing with. And quincunx energy is extremely uncomfortable. It needs a resolution, but it has nothing in common with the planet it's aspecting, or in this case, the point that it's aspecting. Because the south node is not a planet, it's a point. So there's something here between Venus and Jupiter that needs resolution with this south node in Libra. So when we take a look at the houses, we'll kind of pose some questions around what might need resolution where in your particular life. And again, if these things are aspecting your, your natal chart, then that's even more heightened for you in particular. But with Venus, we're talking about our values, right? We're talking about what's attractive to us, what we magnetize, what we find enjoyable. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about our money, things like that. Sitting in Pisces, Pisces has this way of, again, being unbounded, right? Venus and Pisces can be so romantic that it's almost overly romantic in a sense. It can be overly optimistic and kind of um, feeling a sense of like wistfulness, like, oh, it'll just always be a dream. I'll never attain it. So there's something here that's a little bit ungrounded when it comes to Venus. But on the other side, Venus can be so, so, so beautiful in the sign of Pisces when she's connected to the spiritual realm, to our spiritual self, whatever that is for you, whatever resonates for you personally, to things like music and art and poetry. She's beautiful here and she really can light up. So there's something here with that Venusian energy that we need to navigate in alignment with Jupiter. Now, Jupiter happens to be one of the ruling planets of Pisces. And of course, Venus is the ruling planet of Taurus. So we have not only this sextile, but this beautiful mutual receptive energy. So this is a really, really nice flow between these planets. And Jupiter, when we talk about Jupiter, we're talking about expansion, we're talking about elevation, we're talking about exaggeration. When Venus and Jupiter get together, again, the beautiful parts here could be like the belief, the spirituality, the really finding value in that with Jupiter being in Taurus, being able to embody it in some way, being able to ground things in some way, which is so important right now because we don't have a lot of background energy in the earth signs. We have a lot, a lot of energy in the planetary alignments that are more air focused, um, right now a little bit more fire focused, and then water. We really are missing that grounding, particularly because we have Uranus sitting right next to uh, Jupiter. And Uranus is not exactly known for its stability. So the only earth planets we have are sitting in Taurus, being affected by the planet of surprises, the unexpected. And uh, that's kind of shaking things up. And again, making us feel like we don't maybe have a tangible sense of grounding like we've been used to for the last couple hundred years. So Jupiter here, do we have a self-belief? Do we have a spiritual practice? Do we have things within ourselves that we can tap into that are of value? 
Do we have the resources to stay grounded? Do we have the ability to keep going? Taurus is known for its steadfastness, right? Taurus is the rock of the zodiac. Do we have resources, beliefs that we can tap into that are our rock for us personally? It's something to take a look at with this lunar eclipse. And then how is that butting up against, how is that like an itch you can't scratch with the south node in Libra? What needs resolution between the Pisces part of your chart, the Taurus part of your chart, and that Libra part of your chart? It's a question to ask yourself. What feels uncomfortable between those areas in your chart and how can you potentially bring resolution? The nice thing about this particular yacht, again, is because it's Venus ruled with that south node being in Libra. And we've got Jupiter and Taurus, and we've got Venus and Pisces. This isn't one of those yods that's more difficult to figure out. In a sense, I think it'll be a little bit easier for us, again, to sense what needs resolution. And I really don't think it's it's kind of, uh, yeah, I'm just going to say it this way, um, that it's one of those more negative yods. I think it's actually one of the easier ones potentially um, to incorporate, but it is a significant feature of this particular lunation cycle. So when we look at all of that, the other things that we want to take a look at are what victories, right? Because we're talking about a full moon. What victories can you see from the work that you've put in into that Libra part of your chart into letting go of what with the Libra energy is no longer serving you? Right, whatever that happens to be, whether it's that tendency for people pleasing, for dependence, for uh, maybe being a little bit too Aries, right, being a little bit too conflict oriented or too focused on getting your own way, particularly in relationships, right, making sure the other person is actually just serving you. So taking a look at that, what have you been letting go of, or what have you been working on resolving in the ways in which you relate in the world? And then do you have more self-understanding and places, again, where you can ground your own energy? Because we really need that with this particular chart and pretty much all of 2024. <laughs> and the last thing I would, I would pose a question with here is, do you have a sense of interconnection and interdependence to lean on during this time of uncertainty? Right? This is a big uncertain time. We've got all that Piscean energy, that Neptune, as we mentioned, creating so much disillusion for so many people, which is a challenging energy, but it's a very liberating energy, while many other souls are living in escapism and delusion. And that's not easy. That's going to get more and more apparent as we continue on the next couple of years. Then we've got Pluto and Aquarius, right? We've got that Uranian energy shaking up Taurus. All of these old paradigms are falling, which we know, which is part of the cycles, and it can make everything feel a little uneasy in some way, but it can also be really exciting because we know changes are coming, because we know things are coming to a better place for those of us who can see it and who are doing the work internally to bring that about into our external lived experience. All right. So... All right. So when we're looking at this particular eclipse chart, the most potential for personal impact is going to be for those of you that have planets, angles, or the nodes or a sensitive point within one to nine degrees of the cardinal signs. Right. So look for that because those planets are being energized, right? Those angles, those points are being energized by this lunar eclipse. You can also look at the houses that Libra occupies and Aries as well um, in your natal chart to see where this energy is occurring in your particular chart. Now, if you have nothing in this area, this may be kind of, again, one of those eclipses that you see happening out in the world or people around you, but it's not really having a big impact for you personally. Don't worry, other ones will. So talking about the eclipse aspecting natal planets, 
with this, you may have a different uh, viewpoint if you're more familiar with astrology and you have your own types of practice here. When I look at these things, I focus on the conjunction, the square and the opposition because they are the most dynamic of the energies, because they require action in some way. But you're, of course, welcome to look at whatever aspects afloat your particular astrology boat. So when we're talking about the sun, if the eclipse is aspecting your natal sun, there's a huge focus on your life force, your energy, your vitality, your authority and your authenticity. So with this eclipse and the time periods after it, because remember an eclipse isn't just like any transit, it's not just a light switch on off, it has a long lasting period. So when we look at this, what makes you feel vital? What makes you feel energized? And what takes away your vitality? What is draining it? Okay, those issues may come up. It also may come up issues around having to do some kind of healing, doing some kind of reclaiming or renewing of your self-identity. When we're talking about the moon, this eclipse aspecting your natal moon, the focus here shifts to your inner world, your emotional world, right? The moon is the most sensitive part of the chart because it's the most personal part of the chart. So one of the questions to ask is, do you feel nourished, right? Do you have a practice that makes you feel secure internally? Do you feel safe, right? What feels like home to you? All of these things could come up for adjustment during the eclipse. Another place is topics around the past, things coming up like memories or family ties, generational ties, um, roots, things like that may come back up again to be revisited and hopefully to be resolved in a better way or to be um, interacted with in a more skillful manner at this point. Mercury, the eclipse aspecting Mercury. We're talking about themes around the story of your life right? How you interact with yourself and others. What topics may come up for you around things like connection? Mercury is how we make connections. It's communication, it's learning and ideas and your mental processes. So these things coming up again for change and adjustment or getting highlighted and energized in some way. Venus, when we're talking about the eclipse hitting Venus. What are your values? Right? What do you think about the topic of being deserving, right? being, being worthy? What does that bring up for you? What needs adjustment there? It could possibly be around having to examine relationships and relationship patterns. How do you want to make adjustments there? What potentially may need to change? Themes around money of course, possessions and financial stories, what there could need some energizing, what there could need some adjustment potentially. When we're talking about going a little bit further out, we're looking at Mars. So Mars, we can get a reboot around our passions and our desires and what drives us, right? What gets us up in the morning and gets us going in the day? Do we have something that we feel excited to engage with or not? We could also be talking about topics that have to do with when to fight and when to yield, right? Because Mars is not just about fighting. It's also about defending and knowing when to walk away right? Knowing when the fight is not worth it. This could also be highlighting issues around anger and assertion and defense mechanisms. So be on the lookout for that. That can get a little touchy during eclipse seasons um, when the eclipse is aspecting Mars. Just have a healthy outlet for Mars. Have something you can do. Give Mars a job, right? And if anger is coming up, Find a way to release it in a way that's beneficial and constructive. Okay. Jupiter. When we're talking about Jupiter. So again, what's being exaggerated? What's being expanded? What's being elevated in your life? That could be something wanted or unwanted. So take a look at that. Remember Jupiter, like any planet, isn't, you know, 100% great all the time. Jupiter can be a bit of a tricky planet. So 
when we're looking at Jupiter, another piece is where do you need more optimism and faith? Or potentially, where do you need less, right? That's more of a Saturn coming through and saying, hey, we went too far here. But with Jupiter, looking at where do you want to learn? What traveling do you may feel called to um, engage in? What do you want to explore, right? What do you need to do beyond your comfort zone? We're talking about Saturn, the eclipse aspecting Saturn. So one of the questions here with eclipses in particular in Saturn is, what are you afraid of? Saturn can represent places where we feel like we lack, we feel clumsy, we feel um, unskilled, right? And we can be afraid of engaging with our Saturn placement in our chart. So the question here with the eclipse is, are you engaging with your fears? Are you engaging with Saturn in a constructive way? Themes around responsibility and accountability may come up during this period. And then the other question that Saturn can bring up is, are you willing to work on the long game? Are you willing to work on structuring your life in some way, wherever Saturn falls in your chart? And are you willing to work on improvement? Uranus. So topics with Uranus and this eclipse have to do with fitting in and exclusion. You may find, for example, if you have this aspect in Uranus in some area of your chart, or maybe it's the 11th house, something like that, you know, how do you fit in with your friend groups or your social groups or the ideologies? Do you feel like you do? Or do they no longer fit who you are? What does that mean? Do you purposefully exclude yourself? because you don't want to be right in the group for whatever reason. So looking at what may need to be adjusted around topics of fitting in or not fitting in, right? Exclusion. With Uranus, we're also talking about the need for changes and reinvention and revolution and liberation. All of those kinds of topics fall under Uranus. And when we're looking at the nodes, right, we're talking about potentially making big leaps forward. But we're also talking about unexpected or surprising events, right? And revelations. So just remember when Uranus comes in, because it's one of the planets that people tend to get afraid of or not want to engage with because it has such a bad reputation. But when Uranus brings up things, you're going to know that Uranus needs to make changes. You're going to feel the itch and the urge to like, oh, something's got to change. So if you can engage with it and start making little changes, you're in a sense like releasing some of the pressure. And then it's less likely that Uranus will, will express itself through some big outside event. It still could happen, but it helps when we engage with changes that usually we know we need to make but could be avoiding. All right, Neptune. So topics around disillusionment, not seeing clearly and blind spots, which is doubly, triply highlighted on this particular eclipse chart because of that yod and because Neptune is the final dispositor of the chart, meaning it's the planet in charge of all the other planets. So be on the lookout for that. The other place that Neptune could bring up some topics here is increased sensitivity, right? Compassion and intuition. One of the beautiful opportunities here is reconnecting to your spiritual nature and being on the lookout to avoid escapism, including escapism through spiritual pursuits, right? Getting addicted to being out of the body and into spirit or other realms and neglecting the physical incarnation. Pluto, Pluto squaring the nodes. So this is, this is big, conjuncting the nodes, opposing the nodes. Pluto and the eclipses, it's almost like a double down on evolutionary potential leaps forward. So Pluto and the nodes, they can definitely trigger subconscious memories and subconscious wounds. If that happens, remember, Pluto is not trying to punish you. It is your friend if you would let him be. 
when these things come up, it's for you to look at so that you can release it, transform it, alchemize it, and ultimately move beyond it. With Pluto, we could also be talking about themes of detoxification, the need for renewal in some way, rebirth in some way. Pluto also could trigger topics around power and control, whether that's coming from you personally or from the outside. So just be aware of that, right? Have that um, ability to be objective if possible so that you can see what's happening and make choices around what you want to do with it instead of getting caught in reactivity, if possible. If you get caught in reactivity, just look at it later as a learning experience, right? This eclipse aspecting your personal nodal axis. So this has to do in a general sense with adjustments and resolutions between the past and the future. It's in a sense like a check-in, whether you've come around and it's hitting your natal um, Aries North Node, conjunct Aries North Node, right? That would be the starting of a new cycle if it's squaring it. We're talking about making major adjustments so that you are on your path. We're talking about the opposition. Again, that's adjustments that typically play out through other people, through people that we come in contact with. Again, trying to get us on our path to the future, resolving things from our past that we need to leave behind and embracing things that we need to move towards in some way. When we're talking about the ascendant, descendant, axis, we're talking about changes and reorientation to how we see the world, how we interact with others, and who we are right when we walk out our front door. This could bring up themes around the self, right, yourself and your relationships with other people. So we're talking about that first house, seventh house axis. And this also has to do with topics around appearance, right, and impressions, so taking a look out for that. When we're looking at the midheaven and the imam Chelli, we're talking about themes around your reputation, right? Your achievements and your profession, who you profess yourself to be or would like to profess yourself to be. There's something there that can get really energized or need adjustment in some way. Looking at re-examining where you've come from and where you want to go. And also changes to what and where you call home. What does that feel like? It could indicate a moon, but it could also be something like you need to rearrange, you know, a particular room in your house so that it flows better for you. So something along those lines. So recapping that lunar eclipse, now that you have all those planets, remember you're looking for planets that are in the cardinal signs between one and nine degrees putting together anything that you have to get a bigger picture of how this eclipse chart may be impacting your natal chart and your natal planets. So we're going to take a look at going through the houses at this point. Here we go. First house. This is for the Libra rising souls. The first house has to do with the self, how we meet the world, other people's first impressions of us, our physical body, how we steer life, early messaging we received about how we are supposed to be and how life is supposed to be. So with this eclipse, what ways of seeing and being in the world have you outgrown? Sorry for the typo there. It's missing a Y. It wasn't what was. It's what ways. Are there parts of your self-identity that need to be left behind in order for a new self to emerge? How have you been exploring or adjusting the ways that you relate to others? How have your beliefs around work, being of service, or helping others been evolving? Looking at the second house. Virgo risings. We're talking about in the second house, how we support ourselves through our talents, our capacities, our resources, meaning what we were born with, right? What do we have? And then also what can we earn? What is our earning potential? What do we possess, right? What do we find invaluable and what do we enjoy? So when we're talking about this eclipse, what are stories or themes around finances, 
money, possessions? What stories there have you been working on adjusting or need further adjustment? How have your values and what you find valuable been undergoing a rebalance? Remember, Libra is all about harmony and balance. So with that south node there and this eclipse there, there's something that may need to go that has been out of whack, so to speak. What themes around work, partnerships, or resources have run their course? Are there things that you no longer find attractive or enjoyable? And what can you do instead? With the third house... For all our Leo risings, we're talking about in the third house, the local environment, short journeys. So things you could ride your bike to, in other words, talking about making connections, uh, learning, communicating, writing, speaking. And we're talking about potentially relationships to siblings, if you have any. So in this house with the lunar eclipse happening here, what early messaging no longer resonates for you? Do you feel connected to your local neighborhood, to your local environment, and to the people in it? Does it feel harmonious to you? What adjustments need to be made around your career, your partnership balance, and the way you communicate your needs? Is there a new area that you're itching to explore. And that could be a physical environment. It could be something you want to learn. It could be a way in which you relate to your brother or your sister, for example. What could that be for you? The fourth house, my cancer risings. This has to do with our inner security, our sense of privacy and sanctuary, what we call home roots and family and generational inheritance. It's the foundation of the chart. It's the end or the bottom of the matter. And I didn't write this on here, I apologize, but it also has to do with retirement. So for those of you um, where that is applicable, it also has to do with retirement. So how has your sense of inner security been undergoing adjustment? Do you feel that you're in the right home environment that supports your public self, right? What you want to do out in the world? How can you resolve outworn topics around your beliefs and friend groups? What from your past are you ready to put behind you so that you can fully step into your future? fifth house, Gemini rising. This is where we want to shine and be seen. The fifth house has to do with our creative self-expression and our creative self-actualization. It has to do with what I call our inner heart and our inner child. It's the house of fun. It's leisure and pleasure and play and hobbies and love affairs and romance and risk-taking and gambling right? All the fun stuff. <laughs> and it also has to do with children if that applies to you. So some questions here to contemplate are, how has your sense of self-expression been changing in relation to your friend groups and your hopes for the future? What changes have occurred in relation to your children or your inner child, or maybe even both? Are there adjustments that need to be made in order for your romantic pursuits to feel balanced? What needs resolution between your public self, your subconscious self, and your creative self? Could that mean for you? In the sixth house, for my beautiful Taurus risings, the sixth house has to do with our day-to-day -day affairs. It's our routines and it's our rituals. It's the little things, right? It's the details. This has to do with our health, right? Our mind-body connection. It has to do with our working environment. That's applicable to you. It has to do with unequal partnerships, like, for example, student teacher or boss employee. It has to do with our connection to service, our connection to animals and our pets, 
and skills, crafts, and technical details. So the things that you would do over and over and over again in order to master. Remember, this is Virgo's house, and Virgo is also about doing things over and over again in the quest to perfect them in some way. So when we're talking about this lunation happening in your sixth house, what needs resolution between your daily life, your self-identity, and the communities you connect with? What parts of your daily routine or work environment no longer serve your sense of harmony? How can you enrich your spiritual life to balance your routine life? In the seventh house are Aries rising souls. The seventh house is where we encounter the other. And this is in terms of relationships, whether those relationships are intimate, they're romantic, they're business, they're contractual. Any kind of one-on-one -on -one relationship is what we're talking about in the seventh house. So it's the house of equal partnerships, right? This is Libra's natural house. This house also has to do with our adversaries, right? Our open enemies, meaning the people with whom we openly do not get along or agree. And this is also the house of the not self, right? The first house is the self. Seventh house is not self. So it also has to do with our projections, dynamics of the self that are not yet fully conscious or are fully integrated. They get mirrored out in our relationships so that we can see them if we're being skillful about it, right? <laughs> and so that we can resolve them. Remember, whatever you see in another is also in you. And that can be a really good thing. There can be a part of yourself that you haven't fully consciously integrated that is super positive that you think everyone else has but you. <laughs> well, guess what? The fact that you see it means that you have the capacity for it as well. So it doesn't have to be negative all the time, although it could be. So in the seventh house with this lunation happening here, what needs resolution between your material resources your subconscious patterns, and your one-on-one -on -one partnerships. We're looking at that's where the yod would be pointing on your particular chart. In what ways of being in relationship no longer serve your sense of independence? Can you resolve situations with adversaries that are draining your vitality? What patterns have you, re what patterns have you released in terms of how you relate to others? All right, moving along to the eighth house. This is for our Pisces rising souls. In the eighth house, we're talking about transformation, transmutation, and regeneration. We're talking about the psychological, the esoteric, the taboo, and occult subjects. This house also has to do with other people's assets and resources. In essence, it's that which is shared because it has to do with merging and union. It has to do also with intimacy, with secrets, and your private life. This is a big complex house. Some of the things to contemplate here could be around what messaging from your early years and early experiences have been influencing your need for transformation. Have you changed the way you balance topics of intimacy? What buried topics have come to light for you to resolve? And how can you bring better balance to your shared resources? Ninth house, Aquarius rising. So in the ninth house, we're talking about beliefs. We're talking about faith and higher education. We're talking about philosophies and theosophies and the broader view. Right? We're talking about people and culture and ideas that are foreign, meaning they're not the ones that we immediately grew up with or are far away from us. This has to do also with long distance travel and the search for meaning, which we could talk about symbology, right? And publishing and ethics and laws and spiritual truth, teaching and mentoring and guides. It's quite the house. So some of the things you could contemplate in this house 
around those topics, right? Fill in what makes the most sense for you personally, but what worldviews, ideas, or philosophies are no longer bringing a sense of harmony to your life? What resolution needs to be made between your finances, your family, and your belief systems? Are there new topics, ideas, or skills that you would like to explore? This could be a great time to do that. The 10th house, Capricorn rising. So the 10th house has to do with our place in society. It has to do with social recognition and achievements, our professions, and who we profess to be. What we look up to and what we aspire to. It's our inner authority, it's our long-term goals, and it's our legacy. So when we're talking about the lunar eclipse happening in this 10th house, what social identity or public reputation have you been shedding? Right? What no longer fits in this arena of your life? Are there changes to your work home life with that balance that feel more harmonious? Whether those are changes you have already made or changes you know you need to make, what could that potentially look like for you? And what needs resolution between your local environment, your creative expression, and your professional life? How can you get those things to feel more balanced, more harmonious, more civilized and calm? Could that be for you? My 11th house, souls, Sagittarius rising. So the 11th house has to do with our alliances, our groups, right, teams that we like or support or want to be a part of, our friendships, our hopes and our dreams for the future. It's where we make contributions to the collective. It's causes and humanitarian efforts. It's the desire to be a part of and contribute to something larger than the self. And it's interconnection of group consciousness. So quite a big house here. So some of the things to contemplate are what changes have you been making to your friend groups and associations? With that Libra and that South node here, something has been out of balance there. So how has that been changing over the last, let's see, a year and a half, right? What needs resolution between your past, your day-to-day -day routine, and your vision of the future? How can you get those things to be adjusted for better alignment? And really important here, not to be outdone, do you feel you have a new creative outlet for your expression and people to share them with? Or potentially an idea of a group, right? An association that you want to share them with. And finally, the 12th house for my Scorpio risings. You've got Libra in your 12th house, and the 12th house is quite complex. It's the house of self undoing. So I think of it in two ways I think of it as where we go or how we undo the ties that bind, right? Things that trip us up, or it's where we are undone by subconscious blocks that we are tripping over. It's also the house where we return to oneness. So remember, once planets cross over into that first house, they are, in a sense, renewed, right? Reborn as they transit. This house is the house of God, the creator, source, the field, right? It's the mystical. It's the ethereal. It's the unfathomable. It's the intangible. It's the house of dreams. It's unconscious cords of memory. It's channeling. It's where we can be of service to the greater whole, where we need to or what we need to, in essence, give away. Right. It also has to do with those who work against us, what we would call secret enemies, the ones that we don't know about that are maybe doing things behind the scenes that are affecting us negatively in some way. Um, speaking of behind the scenes, the 12th house does have to do with things that are going on behind the scenes. And those don't have to be negative. That can be very positive, right? We can talk about like God or angels or whatever you believe in also working on your behalf behind the scenes. 
or it could be something quite literal. Maybe you design sets, right, for a living with Libra there in the theater. And so you, your work literally sits behind a curtain <laughs> in some way. Um, this is also where we go to retreat from society. And this has to do with hidden aspects of ourselves. So it's quite a loaded house. With this lunar eclipse happening there, what have you been resolving in terms of your subconscious patterns, right? What has been coming up? With that south node there, the nice part is you may have been tripping on a lot of things, but that's good because now you can see that they're there and you can, in essence, like clean them up, right? So you're no longer tripping on them. And hopefully by doing that, you'll feel a greater sense of balance. What changes are you longing to make in your day-to-day -day life that you may have been unconsciously sabotaging? Again, that self-undoing, right? The things that trip us up. Have those things been coming to light? And can you make other changes in your day-to-day -day routine to bring more sense of cohesion between yourself and others? What goes on in the day-to-day -day and what goes on behind the scenes, so to speak? Have you taken some time away to connect with your spiritual side? Or do you need to? What needs resolution between your creative expression, your beliefs around sharing resources, and how you can be of greater service to the collective? What could be going on with those types of topics? All right. So... I hope that gives you a better idea of this upcoming eclipse, how you can integrate and work with some of these planetary energies in your own chart and what this eclipse cycle is about. Now, there's some special things that I didn't get into because I didn't want this video to be too long that have to do specifically with the Pluto and Libra generation, and in particular, the group of souls that were born between late 1980 and mid um 1981, who are getting this eclipse hitting their Jupiter-Saturn conjunction. The next eclipse in Aries is going to be hitting Pluto. And of course, we have Pluto also transiting the south node in Aquarius. So that's a whole other evolutionary leap topic that I hope to get a separate video out on in the next couple of days. Comment below. Let me know if that's you and if you're interested in that. So I'm going to try to get, I'm gonna try to get an extra video out there. <sighs> For everyone else, let me know if this was helpful to you. I hope that it was. That's always my goal to make astrology useful for you so that you actually can apply it to your own life. Until next time, take care. Mm -hmm.